Being a mom is like a thousand little jobs wrapped up into one amazing responsibility. I know from watching my own mom and how crazy it is switching back and forth from traumatic nurse to afternoon mathematician, from organizer-in-chief to five-star chef. This Mother's Day, show her how much you appreciate every job she does with a special limited-time offer from 1-800-Flowers.com. Right now, when you get ahead of the Mother's Day rush, 1-800-Flowers will give you an exclusive 36 for 36 offer. 36 sorbet roses for just 36 bucks. That's only a dollar per rose. With an impressive mix of pastel shades in pink, orange, and lavender, these roses are guaranteed to make her smile. Stunning sorbet roses are the perfect way to surprise all of the moms in your life. Wife, aunt, sister, mother. These breathtaking roses from 1-800-Flowers are picked at their peak and shipped overnight to ensure freshness. 36 sorbet roses for only 36 bucks. It's an amazing offer, but hurry because it expires Friday. Just pick your delivery date and 1-800-Flowers will handle the rest. Don't put this off, guys. Order today from 1-800-Flowers.com. It's what mom would want you to do. To order 36 sorbet roses for only 36 bucks, go to 1-800-Flowers.com, click on the radio icon, and enter code WINGO. That's 1-800-Flowers.com, code WINGO. Hurry, the offer ends Friday. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Carl Tart. I'm Jackie's Neal. And I'm Edgar Mobley's here. And we are the host of a new show called Culture Kings on how stuff works. We cover a whole range of topics on this show, but one of the things that we talk about the most is sports because we love them. Jackie's, what's the sports opinion you have? The Cubs are the best team of all time. That's ridiculous. Edgar? Kevin Durant is the greatest player of all time. Nonsense. My favorite basketball player is LeBron James. He's the king of the world. And we'll get into that on Culture Kings. Download it wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere. Just listen to it, damn it. This is the best of Golick and Wingo podcast. Getting you up and going on a Monday morning. Welcome in. Glad you're with us. Golick and Wingo, ESPN Radio, ESPN News. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. All phone guests join us on the Shell Penzoil Performance Line. I am Trey Wingo. Mike Golick and Mike Golick Jr. are not here today. So in their place, ladies and gentlemen, we have Marcus Spears from the SEC Network, former number one overall pick, or first round pick, rather, of the Dallas Cowboys in 2005. One of two, by the way. We Dang, that was a long time ago. Shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> also with us, Marty Fish. Hello, Marty. Hello, Trey. Thanks uh, for having me, man. You're welcome. So people are saying... Who the hell is Marty Fish? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> oh, who said that? Who the hell Marty Fish is right now? Marty is. I don't is, think uh, anyone said that. Marty's my compatriot that works with me on Wimbledon and U.S. Open coverage. He was born on December 9th, 1981, a former American professional tennis player. He was a hardcourt specialist. He's one of several American tennis players who rose to prominence in the early 2000s. And in April of 2000, Fish overtook compatriot Andy Roddick to become the American number one in the ATP is rankings. This just Wikipedia? Or reaching something? a career high singles ranking of number seven in the world in August of 2011. That! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, is Marty Fish. That's impressive. There you I go. was asking the question, who in the hell is Marty Fish? <laughs> <laughs> and now you know. And now you know. So we are here with you this morning. By the way, I feel like I'm going through, as it's draft week, by the way, which oh, makes me feel very good about things. The draft will take place Thursday in Dallas. We will be down there for Golik and Wingo. And, of course, I will be hosting the draft all three days on ESPN television. But I feel like Marcus... I'm going through and reliving the 2005 Dallas Cowboys draft class. Yeah, because man. On Friday, Golik again wasn't here. Jerk. And, uh, Does we had he Chris... ever work? No, Where he doesn't. They? Where are they? Uh, <laughs> they, they're, they did the Notre Dame spring game over oh, the weekend. Okay. okay. So they're going, re- I don't know if you heard. Well, I did LSU spring yeah. game. I'm here. Yeah, but yeah, exact. Thank you. Okay. Thank All you. Right, I, I don't just... know if you heard, but Mike and Mike, they both went to Notre Dame. They like to talk about Notre Dame just a bit on this program. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've followed for a while. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, they, uh, they, they're down there. You're here. And Chris Canty was here last yeah. Friday. Now, Chris Canty works for Humpty and Canty, 98.7 ESPN New York, uh, 98.75 ESPN New York. And so he was part of the 2005 draft class. So for people that don't understand, this is a perfect story as we get into draft week here. The 2005 draft cast class for the Dallas Cowboys consisted of first round picks, DeMarcus Ware and Marcus Spears. Yes. Two very solid defensive linemen. Then in the second round, they took Chris Canty, defensive lineman out of, uh, University of Virginia. And then in the seventh round, you guys also took Jay Ratliff out of Purdue, who also went on to be an All-Pro. That had to be one of the greatest defensive line draft classes for one team in the history of the NFL draft. Well, we were either going to be done quick (laughs) because Bill Parcells tried to kill us every day in practice, or we were going to have successful careers. That was a great group of guys, man. And we were transitioning to that 3-4, and Bill Parcells had this idea that he wanted big guys up front, fast guys up front, and we all fit the bill. I was just glad... They took me 20 a tray so I could get mom out the hood. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I had to get over the fact that I had got some money yeah. before I actually got to, 
I need to play well in the pros. Well, well, we're glad that all worked out. I'm for glad you. it worked out, George. We're glad that all worked for you. Marty, it's good to have By the way, Marty also Marshmallow Soft. We should we should say that right now. <laughs> really? Okay. Where are you, you you're from a dyna Minnesota, right? Yeah. So yeah. you're used to cold weather, but he's out there in his little La 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 bubble now. Yeah. And I said, Hey you Marty, you're coming up. Why don't we play a little golf? It'll be when you land on Sunday, it'll be like sixty degrees. His response, Oh, that's freezing. I just didn't want to hang out with you freezing. for four hours. That's understandable. And I think for people, more hours. I think people could uh, could 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 rationalize that. <laughs> but you're from Minnesota. And he said it was 60 degrees and it was too cold to play golf. Well, I grew up in Florida. Yeah. And then moved to LA. Yeah. So you're from Minnesota. Yeah. Your sports allegiance are the Twins, the Vikings, the Timberwolves. He's got his Vikings purple on That's right now. That's LSU sure, purple. We'll sure get into that discussion sure a little bit later. <laughs> but but the fact that you Thought it was sixty degrees was too cold to play. Yeah, that's Dude, tough. You are you actually. Are. I landed. I was sixty five and sunny. It's there you go. Pretty nice. There yeah. you go. See, yeah. so we should have played golf. Yeah, you well, messed it up. Yeah, you messed what it up. What'd you shoot? Uh, not great. Uh, but uh, well, that's we, why I didn't play. There you go. Uh, by the way, he's also very annoying along those lines. We'll get into that a little bit later. But let's start as we always do with. It's time for off the top. Whether you like it or not, it's just beginning. With Golik and Wingo. All right, we start off the top with the Cavaliers doing what they had to do, beating the Pacers 104-100 to even this series at two games apiece. LeBron James score, uh, joined Michael Jordan as the only players in NBA history with 100 career 30-point playoff games. LeBron has yet to face elimination in a first-round series in his career, but you still feel like you have to work so hard for these oh. games, right? It's like everybody has to be all all in for this team to go anywhere so far with this playoff run. Trey, I talked about it. Who's your number two? That is and I talked question. to a lot of people about it, and they were like Kevin Love. Well, Kevin Love is not a, a shot creator off the perimeter. Last year, Kyrie was a shot creator. The year they won the championship, he was a shot creator. I don't know. E- even if they get past this Pacers series, you have to have another guy emerge. That's why you look at all of these teams in the playoff. That's why everybody was high on Houston when they got Chris Paul. You had him and James Harden who could create from the outside. I don't see any unless unless players from Cleveland, all right. And who are we talking about? We're talking about Kevin Love. Jarrod Smith may get hot, but do do you stay hot for the entire playoffs? I don't know. I don't think you do. Yeah. Uh who's gonna be that guy to to step up and really Rodney Hood? I mean, yeah, you Jordan look at the Clarkson, names yeah. and none of these guys other than LeBron James is able to create by himself and really carry that team. Because in the fourth quarter he had to do it. You wonder too would would a healthy Isaiah Thomas help yeah. them right now? Yeah, that thing was just I mean, such a mess, a mess when he was yeah. there. I mean, yeah. look, you, you, they would take anything they could get. I mean, everyone thinks Kevin Love is their number two. He had five points in the game. I mean, it, they he had two he had two fouls in the first minute basically. Yeah. They they needed <sighs> so much more uh, from him that they didn't when, get. When, Kyle Korver had yeah. a couple of big threes late. I mean, he was their Which second leading scorer. With 18 points. But let's be honest. How many games are you going to win when Kyle Korver is your second leading scorer in the postseason? I mean, Kyle Korver comes off. Look, I got to give him a lot of love for his ability to come off screens and take two steps and do and, and shoot a three-pointer. But I hadn't seen Kyle Korver beat anybody off the dribble since I was in high school. <laughs> well, that that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Let's be clear. That is, that is not why he's there. That is not his forte. That is not his strength. Uh, but we'll get more into this game a little bit later. I love because, LeBron, too, by the way. So this is very troubling for me. Well, he did what he had to do yeah. yesterday. 32 points, uh, 13 rebounds, 7 assists. Uh, but somebody else, somebody else is going to have to step up on a more consistent basis if the Cavs are going anywhere in this postseason. Off the top. Can they make another trade? Uh, no, they can't do that. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, the top two seeds in the Eastern Conference went down on the road and both dropped to 2-2 two and two in their respective series. The Raptors lost to the Wizards despite leading by as many as 14 points, tying their second largest blown lead in a playoff game in franchise history. The Celtics lost to the Bucks and dropped to 4-11 and 11 in road playoff games under Brad Stevens. So which one of these two teams right now are you more concerned about? What the Raptors aren't doing or what the Celtics aren't doing? I think for me it's the Celtics because the, they're they're young. I mean, when you yeah. look at it, Trey, other than Al Hoffer, none of these guys have a lot of playoff experience. And what do you hear before every playoff? The teams with the experience, the teams that that have been here, we knew we know which one of these guys have been in this moment. That's why everybody's confident with these veterans in the playoffs. But with that being said, man, when you get to a point, especially we were talking about it before the show, Marty, the the playoffs get a lot. They get physical. Refs are more apt to blow their whistle a little mm-hmm. bit earlier, especially against superstars. So 
Boston is struggling because of youth. It's not talent. They have, I mean, they play well this season, but you get to this point and the pressure is on, which is what's surprising about Philly. Yeah, I mean, they I don't have, I'm wrong. They don't have tons of guys who can score, too, Boston. I mean, the, the Bucks are good. I mean, they, yeah, they got a they lot are. of talent. I mean, Eric Bledsoe has played really well the last two games. I mean, he was he was bad the first two yeah. games, you know. Well, yeah, it, he was, Terry Rozier. Yeah. I mean, he, he was so bad. Terry Rozier. He, he, he was he was so bad that he was pretending like he didn't know who Terry you know, Rozier was. He, you know. no, he Eric, knew exactly Eric, who he was. Eric, you know who Terry Rozier is. <laughs> he just, you he knew just who he was, but you just <laughs> you just con- you just continued to introduce the world to Terry Rozier. But he's come back strong the last two games. Golik and Wingo with you. Uh, it is Marty Fish and Marcus Spears with us this morning, and we continue with off the top. Uh, Give it up for the old guys. 40-year-old Manu Ginobili scored 10 of his 16 points in the fourth quarter to help San Antonio beat the Golden State Warriors 103-90 to to stave off elimination. Playing in what will likely be his final home game, Ginobili notched playoff win number 132 with Tony Parker as his teammate. The most playoff wins together of any teammates in NBA history. That's kind of cool. That is cool. I love Manu, too. I just... Manu is a... I, I feel like when you're on the court with Manu, you want to beat him up. Yeah. I really do. That's this way he plays. He and that's gets, a compliment. That's a compliment. Yeah. He gets in your pocket. He all, He's always doing something to affect the game outside of having the basketball. But, I mean, we went through this process with Manu and talking about if he was going to retire a year or two ago and he's come back in the playoffs. How does How does... How does the Spurs keep getting to the playoffs, by the way? I look out there and I look at that team, and you know what I say, Wings? Huh. Ugh. <laughs> but they are good. Wait, wait, yeah. what, wait, what is that again? Ugh. <laughs> but they are good, man. They are good. That yeah. Without this Kawhi is, Leonard, basically. I know. This is the year for you to believe in that system more than any other year. I yeah. mean, I like Aldridge, and Aldridge is good, but I, I throw him in that same category. He has – somebody has to feed him the ball. Yeah. He's not yeah. one of those guys that's going to bring it up. coming off make, the bench, yeah. too. I mean, I mean it's, it's, yeah. it's Patty Mills can make shots. I mean, they got guys that make shots. They play Every, hard. They play yeah. good defense. You, you know what we saw a little bit with them in, in that game was a, was a a championship culture. Because they yes. know they're not winning this series. Yeah. They know yeah. they're not winning this series. And obviously – uh, their coach Popovich wasn't there because he's dealing with with the loss of his wife, and and he's trying to handle all of that. But this was a team that's like, no, we're not being swept. Absolutely. We're, we're, I mean, we may go down, but we're not going out that way. And that's what you respect more than anything else. No doubt. You see out of San Antonio. No doubt. They're like, you know what? We're, we'll go down. But we're not going to go down easy. This is that what you said. Culture. Yeah. We talk about that. I cover college football. Right. We talk about that all the time. The culture. Yeah. I mean, how you lose. America matters. Yes, it does. <laughs> like, You're absolutely it really right. It does matter now in sports. Don't man. don't roll over. Yeah. By the way, Ginobili was in the zone, brought to you by AutoZone. Get in the zone, AutoZone. He was so in the zone at a 40-year-old. Uh, this is exactly what his head coach, Steve Kerr, had to say about Manu after the game. Uh, the other, yeah, excuse, yeah, Steve Kerr, the other head coach, sorry. I know he's old because he was my teammate, and I'm old as dirt. And so <laughs> if I played with him, he must be old. He is. And uh, good for you. Good for Steve for recognizing that. And, and again, good, good for the Spurs. I mean, what you, what you just said there is exactly right. How you lose sometimes matters. They're not going to win this series. No, no, no way chance. But they're not going to just. They weren't going to just bow out they either. Just bow. Oh, we're running up to the clock. Let's see if we can hit the buzzer. So I don't have to hit. The, yeah, off we do. the top. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. Penguins beat the Flyers eight five to win their first round series in six games. Uh, Jake Gunsel scored four and became the third player in NHL history to have four consecutive goals in a playoff game, joining Tim Kerr in 1985 and Newsy Lalonde. I feel like we made that name up. Brad, is that true? Newsy Lalonde is that a real person? That sounds like <laughs> that sounds like somebody from a from a Disney movie from the ice capades in the early. Hey, get Newsy in here to score some goals. Uh, Newsy Lalonde in 1919. Uh, the Flyers. Uh, Can I be honest, real quick? Yeah. When I when I saw that I was gonna be on with Marty Fish, yeah, I was like, "That's his real name." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah, it is. So speaking of names, I mean, Newsy Marty Fish. Yeah, that's pretty. That's a pretty dope. It name. is my name. That's name. That's a good name, man. <laughs> Thank I you. got Marty. So that's boring. It that's is. Sweet. Well, so in other words, this is what you were channeling your inner Eric Bledsoe when you heard about Marty Fish, because this is basically what you said. <laughs> I don't even know <laughs> that is. <laughs> that's exactly what you were doing. Please. Nicely done. I love you, bro. I love you. Don't don't let. That I, I just want to be clear. We need more newsy Lalonde highlights. You don't look like the kind of guy who watches a lot of tennis, anyway. So don't worry about it. 
Actually, no, nah, I'm just, I'm not. My mother is a huge tennis fan. Yeah? Yes. Oh, come like on. Like crazy. You're not a, you, you're, you're not a huge tennis I watch fan? tennis. I okay. do. I do. Okay. I just, I mean, I'm not. Mark, Let's my, get her on the show. You're, you're validated. Yeah, get her on. <laughs> you're validated. Congratulations. I'm not, I'm not running home to catch the tennis match, though. Well, <laughs> we need okay. to talk about that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, congratulations again. The uh, the Penguins move on in their quest for a three-peat, trying to do that for the first time since the Flyers, um, excuse me, the uh, Islanders won four straight in the early 80s. Off the top. And we finish up off the top with the Thunder facing the Jazz tonight at 10.30, down 2-1 in this series. Oklahoma City has lost seven straight road playoff games, tied for the longest road losing streak in franchise history. The Seattle Supersonics lost seven straight road playoff games from 1980 to 1984. So mm. that's what they're trying to avoid. And let's be clear, Russell Westbrook is trying to avoid giving up another triple-double to Ricky Rubio. Uh, and he was adamant that was not going to happen. I'm going to shut that shit off next game, though. <laughs> Guaranteed that. Guaranteed it. Guaranteed that. <laughs> we'll see what happens tonight. Savage. You know what I, I love? I love about Russell. I'm I'm all in for the bitty, the the pettiness and the yeah. bitter. I mean, he's all about it. I mean, only I can have triple doubles. That's basically <laughs> that what he's saying. <laughs> I'm not giving you yours. You you took something that belonged to me. Yes. So I'm curious to see how he responds in this game tonight because that is going to be the most interesting part of that whole. Russell thing. is the hood baller. Yeah. yeah. Like he's the he's the playground beast. Like yeah. you go out if you go to this gym. Yeah. Russell's gonna be there with his boys. Correct. And you might win the game, but you're gonna get beat up on your way home. I right. think Ricky made more shots in that game than he did in game four than he did the entire career with Minnesota. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he was good, though. He was good. Did, I mean, did, did the T-Wolves make a mistake with him and Jeff T? Oh, wow. That's the question. That is, that is, that is a question. That is certainly no, that a is question, question Marty. Right no, it's a question. <laughs> uh, so that is where we are in off the top. But uh, most importantly, when you look at this, we talked about it a little bit. The Cavaliers did what they had to do, tying the series with Indiana at two games apiece, although it almost looked like an exact replay of Game 3. In Game 3, Cavs were up 17 at the half and, and somehow found a way to lose it. They were up big at the half uh, in this game as well. Uh, Pacers came back, took the lead, and then a huge fourth quarter uh, with basically only LeBron and Kyle Korver scoring all 10 points down the stretch, sealed the win for Cleveland as they retake uh, the home field advantage, home court advantage now, and they have two of the final three games in this series on their home court. LeBron, afterwards, happy how it played out. 3-1 is just a, it's a huge def- uh, deficit, and you don't want to ever go down 3-1 versus anybody, no matter if it's first round or mm-hmm. all the way up, and if you're fortunate to get to the finals, it's just too difficult. So with them coming in our home building and taking away home court advantage in game one, uh, we knew in order to get the series back trans- to us having home court, we had to win one on their, on their floor. We had a great opportunity in, in Game 3. Um, but I've always talked about the best teacher in life is experience, and we was able to experience that in Game 3 and not just falter like we did in Game 3 tonight when they made a run. Gold can Wingo, by the way, presented by Progressive Insurance. Commercial insurance through Progressive protects your business and your dream. Choose from over 30 coverage options at ProgressiveCommercial.com. I always love it when people say, as we're here with Marcus Spears and Marty Fish, on Golik and Wingo, that experience is the greatest teacher. Yeah, but only if you apply that lesson, right? Everybody says, oh, experience is so great. I know tons of experienced players that lose all the time. <laughs> because it's it's one thing to get the experience. It's the other thing to take the information from the experience and translate it into something positive. And it seems like that's what they were able to do. They were. And and look, let's be honest, yeah. Frey and Marty. LeBron took over. Yeah, That's the experience. Yeah. I mean, the third quarter, he had three points in the third quarter. We saw the Pacers make their run. He came out, asserted himself, started driving to the basket. Everything hinges on LeBron driving and kicking or getting the ball in the post and making something happen. I don't – there is an issue in Cleveland right now that that maybe existed before. This is how great this dude is. Yeah. We've looked at this Cle- – we've looked at Cleveland teams, and no matter what people say about the East is weak and all of that, which I think it's a – a lot stronger than it has been with a lot of young players. And in a few years, you may see it be the strongest side of the conference. But LeBron has taken t- – let's just talk about the guys on this team. All right. well, you, but I think you just summed it up. The guys. The guys. They're, like, they're guys. Mean, they're just guys. He's his going – His ex- supporting cast since 2007? I mean, 2007 he made the finals. 2007 to the finals yeah. with Booby. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> with that I mean, is here? this team better than that team? <laughs> you know, that's – you you would think they would be, but I'm not sure that they are at this point, right? I mean, th- they that, got more athletic. Yeah. They got younger. We know that. 
Trey. They got healthier. J.R. Smith, Kevin Love, Cal Carver, Jose Calderon. Tristan Thompson doesn't even play anymore. Nope. I got a whole theory on that, but well, it has nothing to entirely. do with basketball. <laughs> that's a whole <laughs> separate issue. Rodney Hood, Jordan Clarkson, Larry Nash Jr. I mean, and they signed Kendrick Perkins just in case they need an inside presence. Yep. I love Kendrick Perkins. He played for the Houston Hoops. I played basketball for the Houston Hoops. I know Kendrick Perkins. But when you sign Kendrick Perkins for the playoffs, that's a problem. You're struggling. Well, Look, here's the deal. At some point in this series and in every series in which they go, if they find a way to get by the Pacers, which still is no guarantee, no, no. they're going to have to have guys like Corver or Calderon or somebody else show up. And Tim Legler said, hey, some of that supporting cast finally showed up in Game 4. Well, they've got some guys on this roster that haven't been in this kind of situation, down in a series, hostile environment, haven't had playoff experience with some of these guys. They haven't had a lot of time together. So who knows who's going to respond. LeBron got just enough help in this one. And it, they didn't shoot great from the three-point line, but they had some timely ones that carried a lot of weight. And LeBron James was fantastic all night. Played a very physical game, getting into the post, taking advantage of his isolations, but played a very smart game as well, I thought, in incorporating his role players into the mix. But anytime he gets single coverage, he was able to get to the rim. He was able to get to the rim. Didn't hit an outside shot. I think it was 0 for 5 from deep. Uh, but the other thing that this game included is another... Uh, another instance of Lance Stevenson being Lance Stevenson down the stretch. A uh, couple, uh, couple of uh, scrums, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Yeah, let's I mean, he, out. He's, he's the guy in football that if he's your teammate, you love him. If he's on the team, you hate him. Right? That, that's exactly who he is. I right? mean, he, 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 jo- he chokeslam yeah. <laughs> green. <Yep. laughs> I mean, it, was, it was a chokeslam, and I liked it. I liked the way, I liked the way he plays. Look, there are not enough NBA. There are not enough Charles Oakleys anymore. Oh, Charles Oakley did not. They don't let him. They don't let him do it anymore. That's so. This is my point. Is this is the closest we're going to get to old school NBA with Lance Stevenson? Yeah. Because what he does, not only being chippy, he actually plays hard. I mean, he make he makes he makes some of the dumbest offensive decisions I've seen in a long time. Fair, but defensively. He is that pestering guy that old NBA used to look like. I like it. I like when he. I like when he likes to try to beat up LeBron legally. Legally, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the question will become: Can they do enough to get past once they, if they can get past the Pacers, where does this team go? And I don't think anybody knows the answer to that question right now. But the other thing is, we're seeing with every other team in the East. I mean, the Celtics were up two nothing on yeah. the Bucks. That's tied at two two. For all the talk about Toronto and the great season they've had, listen, what has been their M.O. in the playoffs? They've never showed up, and look what's happening again. They were up 2 nothing against a Wizards team, which I believe last contributed something in the postseason in the 70s, uh, you know, to, to now that tied at two. So as, as bad as it looks for the Cavs, it doesn't look like anybody else is really stepping up and sort of saying, hey, the East is ours yet, so there's still a little, uh, a little life. By the way, we have an update on Newsy Lalonde, thanks to our, our, uh, our fine researcher, Brett Prada, will get to that in just a little bit. But you'll want to hear the Newsy Lalonde update, and you'll want to hear it from Bet, who, by the way, what I told, was a little disappointed about someone who didn't show up at one of the weddings he went to this weekend. Brett, by the way, goes to more weddings than anybody I've ever met in my life. It's How unbelievable. Golick. Golick and Wingo. And Wingo. Mm-hmm. Trey Wingo and Mike Golick Sr. We're delighted to bring in ESPN NBA insider Brian Windhorse on the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line, taking synthetic motor oil performance to a whole new level. Make the switch to Pennzoil Synthetics today. Wendy, thanks for being with us. First and foremost, let's start with the Cavs game against the Pacers. Where do we stand in this series now? It, it seems like game to game, it feels like a completely different series. Yeah, it's very difficult to get your um, your finger on the pulse of what's going on here. You know, typically you have a pretty good idea of how a series is flowing. You have a typical idea of, of uh, you know, of, of strategies and stuff like that. You see role players sometimes move in and out of relevance, but really normally you have your hands around it by now. And this Cavs Pacers series, it's been very difficult to get a feel at all. And, you know, neither team is playing that well. Um, there's been individual great moments, but it has not been a series where, uh, you're you're blown away by anything. It's really been a, a struggle, and you know we probably shouldn't be surprised by that because these teams were separated by two games in the standings. Um, this Cavs team, despite being a very veteran team, when you go down the roster and looking at all the ages, 
The guys, some of the guys they're counting on have never done it before. And Kevin Love got hurt. Um, he hurt his thumb, and he's playing through it. But if you watch the game last night, he's fumbling balls. He can't get, um, you know, he can't get traction on certain things. And I, I just think, you know, having the Cavs' second best player minimized a little bit even makes the series tighter. So this is this is an absolute slugfest, and because of the overlaying issues with LeBron in the future, and the Pacers trying to get back after. LeBron's beaten them year after year after year. There's a there's an even extra layer of uh, spice on top of what's been a street fight. Wendy, staying in that vein, how who is the number two? You just Kevin Love dealing with an injury. Who's the number two guy off the dribble that could possibly come alive and carry the Cavs in case? Very rare, but in case LeBron has an off night. You have just hit on the exact issue that has happened to LeBron James. I think if you if you take a 30,000-foot view of this entire situation from the moment that he won the championship in 2016, uh, the Warriors added Kevin Durant, um, making themselves uh, a juggernaut. They already were damn good, but becoming a juggernaut. And then a year later, uh, he lost Kyrie Irving when he asked for a trade and got traded. And so... His team has significantly diminished, um, and the other teams have gotten better. And so you have LeBron in a position that he's not normally in. And uh, we can break down in in interesting little corners of moments and whatnot, but at the end of the day, you're looking at a Cavs team that's the four seed. Um, And I know that LeBron will go on and on all, all year and say the seed doesn't matter, And there's some truth to that, I suppose. But um, this is the lowest seed he's been in 10 years. He hasn't been this low since 2008. So you're looking at a team that just, quite frankly, isn't as good as other teams he's been on. And we're seeing that slimmer margin for error take place in this series. They can't survive when uh you know an an opposite opposing player has a great game like uh boyan bogdanovich had on friday night they can't survive uh you know their own role players struggling he just doesn't have the same firepower on his side even though he's playing well and he's putting up giant numbers he doesn't have the same team and i mean i know we all we've all known that for months now but it's manifesting itself right in front of us well, that leads us to the biggest question uh, this off season. Brian Windhorst with us on uh, ESPN Radio and ESPN News this morning on Golik and Wingo. What is the future, regardless of what happens this season, whenever it ends, for the, this Cavs team, which has been remade, what, four times this season alone, what happens next for LeBron? What is the future going to be like this summer? Will he opt out? Do you think he wants to stay? Trey, I honestly don't think he knows. And that's you know, frankly, a, a defeat for the Cavs because this is a guy who has said on multiple occasions he wants to finish his career in Cleveland. And I do honestly believe that's what he wants to do. But you look at this team, it's the most expensive team in the league. Um, it's not like they, they're going to have cap space anytime soon. Um, and, you know, they've elected to invest in the future more than the present when they made the primary trade piece for uh, Kyrie Irving a draft pick. Now, that may end up being... I guess smart, but it, that draft pick didn't score any points last night, you know, and he's not going to score any points on Wednesday. <laughs> and so, um, you know, you know, LeBron is going to have to just wait and see. And I think if you're a team out there that has had dreams of getting LeBron, the steel sign is there. Wow. But even those teams, there's still not a spot out there where LeBron looks and goes, that's where I would go. That's where I'm ready to accept the blowback from leaving Cleveland again. That's where I want to go trust the team with my third act of my career. There isn't, at least today, now that could change by the end of June or the first week of July, but there isn't a team out there that's feathered its nest where it's perfect for him. There's there's some contenders. We could talk about the contenders for two hours. But I I think LeBron, if if the season had ended this week, or if it does end this week, I think he's going to have to spend the next two months evaluating what's going to happen. And the Cavs will have to spend two months deciding whether or not they want to use that draft pick on a young player or whether they want to trade it because they're trying like hell to hold on to LeBron James. Do you genuinely believe, Brian, that he would want to stay – in the East or go to the West? I mean, I just don't see how he would want to be out in the West to have to go through a Houston or a, or a Golden State. Uh, would something like Philly uh, be, be the perfect place for him? 
Well, I don't think, honestly, right now he could sit there and say, oh, here's option A, option B, option C. There's just not a lot there where he knows, like, this would be great. So, like, you could say Philadelphia, but at the moment right now, Philadelphia doesn't have the cap space to add him. Uh, they could do some things to get there, um, but they but they don't. I mean, I, I know a lot of people have jumped to that conclusion, um, but, um, you know, they'd have to take some pieces off their roster to do it, and I don't know if that would change the arithmetic at all. Uh, to me, and this is what I've said, I honestly believe that LeBron's future is tied to what happens to Kawhi Leonard. Um, what happens with Kawhi will affect what LeBron does. doesn't necessarily mean that they'd end up playing together, but if Philadelphia, for example, focuses all of its efforts on, on trading for Kawhi Leonard, it may make it not so feasible for them to acquire LeBron. Uh, if, if, the, if the Lakers are able to get in there, get Kawhi Leonard in some sort of trade, then all of a sudden that maybe affects how LeBron looks at the Lakers. If Kawhi ends up staying put in San Antonio, it's not out of the realm of possibility that the Spurs could get LeBron's attention. I don't think that's necessarily likely, but that changes it. That's why I say, like, to a certain extent, what happens with Kawhi will affect what happens with LeBron, because if LeBron's going to move, if LeBron's going to sever ties, it's not going to be for a hedging bet. It's not going to be, well, if I go to Philly, it's going to be for a a badass team, okay? And so right now, I promise you, there are teams out there that are that have had their whiteboards, even if they're in the playoffs right now, and they're constructing how can we get this badass team together? That's how teams have gotten LeBron in the past. And if if you honestly think that you can get him, you move heaven and earth. And we're also in a bit of a transition period in the NBA. We could see other player, other major stars on the market. We don't know what's going to happen with the stars in in Portland, for example, after they went out. Well, one of those guys. Uh, be available. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen with Paul George. I mean, you know, there's a lot of fluidity that can happen that, can, that LeBron can massage. And if you're a Cavs fan or if you're the Cavs organization, you want him playing basketball for the two, next two months. You don't want him sitting there with his phone plotting with people about how they're going to all of a sudden make a move. Because remember, the biggest deal that happened in the league last year was Chris Paul getting traded to Houston. That was the deal that was con- completely constructed by James Harden and Chris Paul because they were sitting at home during the finals, hanging out and plotting the future. That's how the NBA works. And, of course, uh, their teams were involved. Of course, the Rockets were telling James Harden how to do it. Well, that's what's going to go on if LeBron James has two months to figure it out. Well, listen, you, by the way, Brian Windhorst with us, our NBA insider. If nothing else, you've given me my fantasy football name for next year's team. Brian Windhorst, badass team. That's going to be the name right. of my, my fantasy football team. <laughs> that is definitely going to work. But that's the off season, and it's the NBA off season is always fascinating, Wendy. But the thing that I like about this playoff run, remember last year it was twelve and zero for the Golden State Warriors to get to the Western Conference Championship and, and the Finals, twelve and one for LeBron and the Cavs to get there as well. It sure feels like this is going to be a much more interesting road to get to the Finals than we've seen in the last three years. For sure, for sure. Um, you know, the Warriors, quite frankly, they're just not playing great basketball. And it's not even just not having Steph. They're, they're just not playing their top end. And that's one thing's interesting. Um, we see the Raptors who, you know, they've reverted a little bit back to last year. Now that's, I mean, I still think they're going to be okay, but it's a toss-up series now. They're now in a in a 2-2 series playing against a team with two All-Stars. That's not very comfortable. We have no idea what's going to happen in that Bucks celtics series. That may be the hardest series to read after Pacers-Cavs. Um, you know, really, the only team that I've watched so far and said, boy, they've really, really super impressed me has been the Sixers. And, you know, maybe this is the year. I mean, you know, I, you know, I remember, you know, four years ago, uh, the Warriors, you know, catching fire at the right time, being great, and they broke through and announced their arrival on the stage in a year where it was in transition, where the heat had faded, where the, where the Spurs had faded. There was, a, there was a window for a new team to step through, and the Warriors did that. Maybe that'll be the Sixers, but we still have a long way to go, and, and, and I don't feel like I know what's going to happen in most of these first-round series, and that's not something we've said in a long time. Brian, let's talk about the only team really to get to the second round already, the Pelicans. Are they just this good or was this just a matchup sort of thing for the for uh you know for them to beat the Blazers yeah i went to the game one of that series and i was convinced it was going to be a 6 or 7 game war 
and I can't believe how well um, how well it's how well it went for the for the Pelicans. What what I think we're seeing right now is uh, what I call the Matrix moment, um, which I know dates me a little bit. And says the Matrix is like twenty years old now, but no, it's still you know, awesome. The, Don't worry about it. When the Keanu Reeves character figures out he's better than everybody, and it's just over. Like Anthony Davis is having his Matrix moment. Um, it's happened in different years for different superstars. Like for example. I've been watching and waiting for Giannis to have it. Giannis hasn't had it yet. You know, we've had two, uh, you know, very close games in that series. He had a tip in yesterday. But Giannis, someday I honestly believe, will realize he's better than everybody and just start winning games. This is Anthony Davis' sixth year. Until last week, he'd never had a playoff win. Now he is taking games and bending them. That's that's the best way I can I can put it. And I know it comes out of the matrix, but... Like, this is what Jordan used to do. Jordan used to take a situation and just bend it. And LeBron's done this for a decade plus, just bend the game. Well, Anthony Davis is doing that now. And Drew Holiday, his uh, running mate, is also coming into his own, playing the best basketball of his life. And this tr- this trade that they made after Boogie Cousins got hurt for Nico Miritich. Nico Miritich, this guy that, you know, who was a bit of a, a you know a frustration player for the Bulls for the last couple of years, he he makes quick decisions. He rebounds. He's like the perfect third guy. Now you're looking at these guys. You're like, oh my god, they've got confidence and they've got this killer guy. They've got this this ace in the hole. This guy who can change a game. And so now they're sitting there. And, and the Warriors just lost two days to prepare for them by not being able to finish off San Antonio. So, um, you know, we'll see what happens with Steph Curry and whether he's able to come back in that particular series. But, man, uh, you know, we're seeing Anthony Davis come into his own. It could be one of the most relevant things we see happen in this postseason. Brian Windhorst is with us, our NBA insider. And, Brian, yeah, it is fun. And, and uh, what, what we've seen uh, from uh, – the San Antonio Spurs, I thought was a culture win more than anything else. We're just not going to fold. You're going to have to beat us, which I thought was pretty cool. But one thing we talked about at the end of the regular season with you was the was the MVP vote. And it seemed like it was going to be James Harden's to win, and then LeBron, of course, plays all 82 games and puts up phenomenal numbers. And there was the one game in the postseason that I thought made the argument for LeBron James, and I understand it's a regular season award, but when you have a Houston team that can suffer through a game where James Harden goes 2 of 18 and still win by 20, and then you have LeBron who has to do everything for his team to win any game. It, it certainly built up a, perhaps the argument for those that were thinking, hey, maybe LeBron is the MVP of the league after all, every year he plays. Did you Did you finally – I know you had to submit your vote. Are you comfortable sharing where you went on that vote? Yes, shit, Brian. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, by the way, can you imagine what would happen to the Cavs if LeBron went 2 of 18 in the right. playoff game? That's my point. I, I mean, mean, they, they, they lose might, by 40. They call it at the half. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I voted for James Harden, and um, it, was a, it was a difficult vote. I, I think a lot of people just thought it was a layup. I, I analyzed it more and, and twisted and turned on it more. James Harden was so phenomenally great this year. Uh, he's done things offensively. That, has re- that have really changed the nature of the way certain plays are run. It, his isolation basketball and his step back and some of the things he's done are, are at the highest level ever done in the NBA. And believe it or not, you know, there are different ways to evaluate defense. There is no magic bullet, but there are certain measures of defense, statistically at least, where he ranked ahead of LeBron this year. Um, and even in this series, I don't think LeBron's play as as has, has distinguished himself on defense at times. Uh, so you know they had a top uh, six, I think five or six defense in the league, and James Harden was a part of that. And so all of that went into it. And you know this is the thing that fans can't understand because you know you sit in this chair every single day and you know the culture better than anybody, Trey. But uh, it's a it's a very much of a of an absolute culture. If you don't like, if you vote for this guy, this guy must suck. You know, it's, right. you know, uh, you know, it's one or the other. It's, that's not true at all. It's, it's completely nuanced. And I recognize LeBron having a historic season, doing remarkable things. And I say, even with that. James Harden has elevated that highly. And so I gave James Harden my vote. Uh, I, I wish that LeBron had more than four MVPs because I don't feel great about it, but James Harden earned it. And also James Harden, you know, the whole body of work for the entire from October, the award is, is for October through April. And there was a couple of periods in there where LeBron just wasn't his best. Now he's still winning player of the month in those awards, but compared to James Harden, it was hard. So, I, I I I didn't love it, but I I felt it was the right decision to put Harden number one. We're joined by Brian Winhart, CSPN NBA reporter. Brian, shouldn't they change the name of this award if LeBron is not going to win it every year? 
you know, here's the thing. Like, we can have that debate, but the NBA loves this. The NBA wants there to be a debate because it wants the value to be put on the award. It wants people to fight for it. It wants it to be relevant, especially now that they have an award show. And instead of normally the MVP would be announced like right about now, maybe the end of this week, early next week. Um, now the award is not until the after the season. And so if the debate rages on, it's even better for the league. So like it's a, it's a, it's a twofold argument, you know, one. Yeah. You know, should there be a, a, an award honoring somebody for having the best season, just kind of like in the NFL where you have a player who wins like best offensive player um, and, then, and then an MVP? Or, you know, sh- should you, uh, you know, somehow define the award a little differently about what the word valuable means? Yeah, you know, there's probably the, the NBA is probably a little behind some of the other sports in the way it has its awards. But uh, at the end of the day, the NBA is all about maximizing and leveraging, um, you know, interest and fan uh, support. And I think the debate as it rages on, even as the vote is now more than a week old, the fact that this is still being discussed on uh, the biggest sports radio show in the morning in the country is a victory for the league. And that's exactly what they want. Well, listen, it's certainly a hot topic and we'll find out eventually who gets it, but it, it's a fascinating debate when you, when you put into context what the word valuable actually means. It usually just means the best player on the best team that season, but if you put it in the context of what value they contribute to the team, it's a completely different dynamic. Wendy, as always, we appreciate it, man. Thanks. Have a good week, guys. Uh, I tell you what, a great sports night last night, yeah. no doubt about it. And Wingo. What a day, what a show, what a time. Hey everyone, Mike Golick here. Support for the Golick Wingo podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. Rocket Mortgage is simple, allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash mics. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org number 3030. Winning at sports and at sports broadcasting means changing things up. Just like La Quinta Inns and Suites is changing up their look. A renovated lobby that's so contemporary it even makes Golik look cool. Yes, it does. And a totally updated fitness center that even has Wingo feeling like a workout. I'm ripped. Plus, plenty of comfortable spaces to hang out. Yeah, this La Quinta look definitely has a vibe of victory. So you can just relax, refresh, and get ready for your next big meeting. Prepare to win at business with La Quinta Inns and Suites. Book now at LQ.com. <laughs> I love you, bro. Uh, I love the fact that on the show with a guy whose name is Trey Wingo, you're worried if Marty Fish was his yeah. real name. You always think Fisher. Yeah. I thought y'all had shortened it on me, and I wanted to make sure I knew his whole name. Marty Mo- Fisher. Moms is the tennis fan in the family. There yeah. you go. Yeah. There you go. But your mom knows. Yeah. Moms always know. Shout out to my mom, by the way. Shout out. Shout out. Oh, fine. Shout out to my mom. Okay? Everybody do it. Quick. Everybody cook. do it. Cliff, Master Cook, shout out to your mom. Shout out to Leah Augustine. <laughs> Bubble Boy, shout out to your mom. Shout out to Eileen King. Stanzik, shout it out. We're all shouting out to mom. Jer Bear, shout it out in the back. Brett, go shout out to your mom. Hi, mom. There you go. Everybody's <laughs> mom's taking care of it. Allie, Allie, go. Susie. There you go. Everybody's mom's taken care of. Glad we got that straightened. Go look at, uh, there you go. Yes, buy them all flowers, but only from 1-800-Flowers.com. The, the sorbets? Choice. Uh, we are presented by Progressive Insurance. All phone guests join us on the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. Coming up in just about 30 minutes, Mel Kuyper Jr. will join us to oh, break down the draft. Try. Come on. <laughs> Mel is fired guys. up. He is fired up. We had our pre-draft meeting in Baltimore because you know, it's a home game for Mel. We all have to go to Mel. Go That's to how Mel. you know who runs the show. We all have to go kiss the ring from all over the country and be with Mel. He, he got so wound up in the first five minutes of that draft meeting, I thought his head was going to explode. I mean, his face was the color of your shirt. He's talking so fast, the oxygen wasn't coming in. You mean Vikings purple? Yes, Vikings purple or LSU or purple. Or LSU, either way. Either way, either way it works Teach for me. Own. So we'll, 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 we've joined by Mel in a few minutes and we're excited for that because the NFL draft is what everybody's talking about now is it's draft week and let me give you the good stuff. And, of course, it's brought to you by Lowe's. Pros in the nose start with Lowe's. Go to Lowe'sforpros.com for details. Everybody's got their mock drafts out uh, now. Uh, got Lowe's. 
All right, I'm sorry. No good. Roll with it, man. <laughs> no, I was, I was good. I was, Be it you. Just was, it was, is that how that song goes? It came out. All right, it's it all just good. came out, Trey. I'm sorry for interrupting you. Brother, it is all good. All right, I ain't all got right. no issues. All right. Let me be clear about that. So it is draft week. Again, Golik and Wingo will be there uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I'll be hosting the draft Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Always a lot of fun. And there's always one guy in every draft. There might be two this year. but There's at least one every year where you're going, okay, where is this guy going to go? And I think this year it might be two quarterbacks. Lamar Jackson out of Louisville, and obviously Baker Mayfield. Because it seems like you're in one of two camps with with Baker. You either love him or he rubs you the wrong way for, for a variety of reasons. And it's understandable both sides. Um, Baker Mayfield is going to go very high in this draft. Um, the question is, is it going to work at the next level? Uh, because, it, look, if he was 6'3 or 6'4, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Let's just be honest about it. Uh, but the fact that he's just over six feet is causing some people some concerns. And then you hear, well, there's the, the Drew Brees, is, he's just over six feet. Yes, he is, and he's done very well. And Russell Wilson, just over six feet. He's done very well. Yes, he is, but is Baker either one of those guys? We're about to find out. Baker Mayfield was a guest this week on Marty Smith's America, which, by the way, is taking off the podcast. You can Man, check Marty. it out. Download and subscribe on the ESPN app as well as Apple Podcasts. And here is something of that conversation uh, that Marty Smith had with Baker Mayfield. The maturity issues, you know, that all these draft gurus, whatever you want to call them, they have never played football before, so it doesn't really matter when it comes down to it. But they say the issues would be maturity. Like I, they say they don't know if I could be a franchise guy. Um, I've been the face at Oklahoma for fortunately for three years at a place that you know there's you talk about the Alabamas the Ohio State the Clemsons the Michigans the USC I mean it doesn't get bigger than that so I've been preparing myself even though I didn't know it for for this next step for a while now and um, I'm just I'm ready to go have it all be about football and I can't wait for the rest of that Marty Smith podcast uh, with Baker Mayfield by the way in my head as I'm hearing Baker say maturity issues I'm, I'm I'm assuming he's air quoting it at the you know maturity issues, but let's be clear: there is a list of things that have come across Baker's Mayfield's career at Oklahoma that make you pause. Now, I could care less about planting a flag at Ohio State; yeah. it doesn't bother me in any way, shape, or form. The fact that the Kansas players wouldn't shake hands with him—that's kind of on the Kansas players. Let's be honest about that. Now, the sideline gesture where he grabbed a certain area that you probably shouldn't grab—that's on Baker. But it was in response to the Kansas players trying to bow up. And then they got you know their their butts kicked by, yeah. by Oklahoma and Baker Mayfield. The bigger issue, obviously, <clears throat> is uh, being tased, being run away from police. That's a hard one that's to get around. Hard to be. <laughs> that that's kind of a hard one to get around. And he's going to have to answer to that. The thing that bothers me about that is the way he answered that question. You know, almost as if, oh, give me a break with this stuff, dude. You put it out there, okay? You put it out there. You're going to have to answer for it. And I think more than anything else, the way he answered that question sort of made me go, all right, well, what's that about? I'll let you go, Marty, because I'm I'm finna go on a rant. All right, here we go. <laughs> well, I only got one thing to say about him is that you're not going to change him. Like I said, you know, no. like his personality is what it is, and and I'm, I've never been in an NFL locker room, obviously, but if he's going to come in and act cocky and and not excel, that's an issue. If he's going to come in and act cocky and excel, then I don't think guys are going to have an issue with it. Here's the problem. Here we go. And go. And Q. Here is the problem. At some point, Baker Mayfield's team said, make this seem like this wasn't you. All right? Because what he just, like how he explained that, it's like we created those stories. Correct. Like we created this persona of Baker Mayfield without actually seeing and knowing the things that you've done. There is we I had this discussion last year with a lot of guys. I was at Florida when all of the guys got suspended. All right. It comes to a point where it's choices, not mistakes. Yeah. It's decisions that you are making. And all we can do is believe what you're telling us. So Baker is cool. Throw it out there. Now there are there have been players come through the draft process that would have never even went any place close to saying what he just said. That's Baker Mayfield. Right. Though. And and that is the problem that everybody has up until this point. His talent doesn't supersede what he says and does. And and there's a difference, Trey. I know in America, people want to think that everybody should be treated fairly. Well, in sports, everybody's not. 
your talent gives you a longer leash depending on how good the you more are. You can, the more you can do, the, the more the, you can, the more they'll put up with. Absolutely. No so, so when, when, when he says something like that, like you, like you alluded to, it just reminds me of who we think Baker Mayfield is. Yeah. That's, I mean, it, that to me validates it. Now to your point, Marty, and I'm with you a hundred percent. When you're a baller, you can get away with that. And dudes will believe in you in the locker room. The only thing that I would be careful of, and, and I'm not, I, I think Baker is a talent. Don't get me wrong. There's no question about it, that. It's no question that he's a talent, but the, the talent to the extent of what, how the conversation has been, the narrative of Baker Mayfield, I just don't know how that's going to be received. Well, th- that's the thing. Look, and everybody swears, hey, his teammates love him, and they should. Because that all works. And that all won. when when it's eighteen, they win. <laughs> yeah, they win a lot, and it's eighteen to twenty-one year old <laughs> yeah. kids. But you know, if, if you're your fifth year in the league as a defensive lineman, and you're looking for make sure you secure that next contract, and you got mouths to feed, that whole rah rah stuff only works if 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 the wins follow it up. Like Drew Brees is uber competitive, <laughs> and he gives those speeches. But you know why they all rile him? Because he puts it out there. Yes, I mean he's got. Five of the nine 5,000 passing yard seasons in NFL history, over half of them have Drew Brees' name on them. So, listen, the rah-rah stuff works because that works. That works. The rah-rah stuff never works if the other part and doesn't I'm gonna say, work. From my experience, Trey, as when I was playing with the Dallas Cowboys, as a defensive guy, yeah. right, Tony Romo could say what he wanted to say because we felt confident that Tony Romo was going to deliver Lay it and on the give line. us a chance to win every game that we played in. That matters. We listen to that. You, they're in the league. The dynamic is so different. And I don't think like college players don't grasp it. I didn't grasp it right. before I got to the league. This is your livelihood now, right? Like I have a wife with three kids and I'm playing in the NFL. And if I get a quarterback that comes in and we go one in 15, you know what usually happens? They look for everybody else to fire before, before they the fire the quarterback. Right. So that mentality is what you have to carry over when you go pro. And, and with Baker, with his personality, his style, and how everybody has talked about, oh, he should be a high draft pick because he can galvanize a locker room. Go to that locker room and lose and see how many dudes you galvanize yeah. on that level. Now, in college, yeah, I can talk my way because we're we're a little bit, you know, college players like to be hype. Right. We like the rah-rah. When you get it's up there business. with those grown men, though, yeah. Are are you producing? Because I like this paycheck that I'm getting. Yeah. And this paycheck helps my family yeah. and it keeps us in the situation that we're in. Cause problems with that. Yeah. And see how that see how far that rah rah gets. Look, the best speech I've ever seen was by Derek Carr when the Raiders two years ago had that back to back road swing on the on the road in Florida. He said, Look, guys, I'm gonna give you everything I have today. All I ask is that you give me it back in return. That's all you really That's need. You That's need. the speech. That's yeah. all the speech you need at the next level. And we'll see if it works out. Golick and Wingo. It was all sort of one big giant yeah. jello mold. It's very interesting where that went. Um, we have a huge announcement, ladies and gentlemen. Hear ye, hear ye. <laughs> oh yay, oh yay. Her Royal Highness, the Duchess of Cambridge, was safely delivered of a son at 1101 hours. The baby weighs 11 pounds, 7 ounces. The Duke of Cambridge was present for the birth. Her Royal Highness and her child are both doing well. (laughs) (laughs) That's a a Bitmaster Jare Bear. Jare Bear, yes. Jare Bear, well done. Oh, yay, oh, yay. As we have a new royal baby, uh, the Duke of Cambridge. Okay, so it's Brett... Researcher Brett, who hasn't been on the show enough this morning, <laughs> Brett. So where look, I'm I'm unclear as to the royal lineage succession plans now after the Queen. So take us through all what this means and and this new baby. Where is he in the line of of succession? Uh, so the the currently well, we don't know the name of the baby, obviously yes. the baby healthy. boy. Yes. Uh, so Queen Elizabeth, she yes. is uh, getting up there, ninety two. <clears throat> Uh, next in line for the throne would be Charles, Prince of Wales. Yes, we knew that. Next in line after him would we be did. his eldest son, Prince William. Prince William. Duke of Cambridge. Yes. Now, 
as he started having kids, he started pushing his brother back in line. So Harry's Harry's going down farther down the food chain. Harry's going Harry down, it. so it yes. goes Prince George, which is William's first son. Yes. And then Pr- Princess Charlotte, his daughter. Yeah. And now the uh, you know currently unnamed child is uh, number five in, run- in front of Harry, who's six. Marcus has a question. Raise what do you got? Hand. Yes. What do they school? do? Yeah. They live a better life than us. I mean, yeah. I know they get, I know all the perks and we talk about what, what is their actual job? Well, the, the, I believe the title, <laughs> Brett, is they serve, the queen serves at the pleasure of the people. Is that, is that yeah. not the way they describe it? I believe so. They don't have any political anything uh, going on. Okay. She's just the queen. She They're serves at the pl- pleasure of the people. Yes. Yeah. With that big guarded thing. Like if you yes. need coffee, okay. like she'll right. get yeah. you coffee. By the way, we think you're you're ninth in line and Marty, you're tenth now in, okay. in succession for the. I was going to say, the, 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 the baby Windsor boy is now. ahead of you. Yes. That's all we need. Yeah, yeah. Jared Bear is the best. Well, I think Marcus wants to be the next town crier. Uh, I think so. All right. So as we continue this morning, you know, Marty is a former number one tennis player in, in the United States. Um, played very well. What six ATP wins, right or seven? Did I short you one? Uh, six. Six. Wins. There you go. Cool. So you're, you're known for long rallies in tennis, especially on clay. God, it can go forever, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So not lot- me specifically. No, not, no, but, no, yeah. no, not you specifically. But we've seen clay court rallies last, mm-hmm. you know, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five strokes. Easily. It happens yeah. all the time. Easily. Well, we had something that might have set a record, might have set a record over the weekend. Uh, Brandon Belt of the San Francisco Giants fouled off. A lot of pitches. I think it was it was a twenty one. It was a twenty one pitch at bat. A twenty one pitch at bat before he lined out. Um so congratulations in the in the length of time since the late eighties, right, Brett? Since the late eighties, since they've been tracking pitches, it's the longest at bat they can remember. But because Marty is well versed and you got a minute to tell the story, uh in in uh. many circles, he has a brand of all people, Marty Fish has a Brandon Belt story. One minute go. Uh Justin Verlander and I were Headed to the car show in Dane LA. Dropper. Justin Ready. Verlander, star. Dane and Dropper. the reason why I say Justin's name is because uh, he bought a car that they only had fifty of. Yes, 50. Uh, Mercedes with a and, Formula uh, One engine. Right? Yeah, 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 pretty pretty expensive car. And um, uh, so the guy uh, that sold it to him was uh, going about how Justin, MJ, and LeBron were the only three athletes that the were only three. Able. Justin Verlander. Michael Jordan and LeBron, the only three that had this car. 20 minutes about this. Yeah. About how he, they were the only three. Yeah. And then uh, we go over and uh, get a drink, and Brandon Belt comes up and says, Hey, I'm Brandon Belt. I play first base for San Francisco Very Giants. cool. Yeah, very cool. He's super nice. What are really you doing nice here, guy. they say? What are you doing here? So uh, oh, I was lucky enough to uh, be able to buy one of these cars. <laughs> <laughs> so the salesman's whole pitch was, hey, Justin, Justin, only you, MJ, and LeBron, and then 21 pitch Brandon Belt shows up. Hey, just bought the same car. Justin they was. Have the Big uh, Mac. We uh, have the Big Mick. Yeah. Justin you know, was audited out. He was a spot cross about hmm. it. Coming up, as we said, it's draft week, and we have Sir Lord of Mel from Baltimore. Golick and Wingo. Let's not expect too much. There's only one person out there that's expecting way too much out of this guy too early. We know who that is. It's his father. Every deck is made for standing on, but there's only one that's always had a way of standing out. So if you're looking to bring more style, comfort, and creativity to your life outdoors, call on the brand that's known for making the most in outdoor living. From decking, railing, and lighting to furniture, fencing, and framing, at Trex, we're engineering what's next in outdoor living. To learn more about all of the outdoor solutions Trex has to offer, call 1-800-289-TREX or visit trex.com. That's T-R-E-X dot com. Nobody, I mean nobody, has trusted the process more over the years than the man who invented the process. <laughs> Je m'appelle, Mel et Mel. Mel Kuyper uh, Jr. joins us on Golik and Wingo. How are you, big boy? I'm good. That's why it's Saturday night. We're worrying about undrafted free agents, right? So really, the draft yeah. extends to Sunday when we find out where all these guys that don't hear their name called to end up landing, which is sometimes uh, you know, some good, pretty good stars, some, some starters in the NFL were found with those undrafted guys. Tony Romo, Kurt Warner, just a couple of names to throw out of people just right name now. Just to name a few. Just yep. to name a few mm-hmm. of the very many. All right, Mel, mm-hmm. so put into... Uh, mm-hmm. Your own words, exactly what draft week means for you. Because you, you've you been doing this really, every draft you start about two years in advance in preparation. Yeah. So when the draft yeah. week it's- is finally here, what does it mean to you? 
Well, it means a lot in terms of you know, your preparation is pretty much over. You finalize your ratings, which I did yesterday, positional rankings and the top group and what have you. What I was working on this morning would probably shock everybody. I was doing a top 10 list for next year's draft and a top five quarterback list for next year's draft, which is going to be used when we're doing day three, Trey. Yep. So this morning and last night, I spent looking at guys for next year's draft already. McShay's got his first round mock for next year coming out the week after the draft. I got this coming out on day three. So it's amazing how many things kind of tie together when you think you're worrying about the draft choices coming up. We already know what we know about those guys. And now we're already worrying about guys for next year. Yeah, the wheel never stops spinning, basically, is what no. Mel's saying. And it was at this time no. last year, Mel, we first started her hearing you and Todd yeah. say, hey, Sam Darnold could be that guy that goes yeah. number one overall in the 2018 draft. You said this in 2017. So what do you think the likelihood is now that Cleveland pulls the trigger on Sam Darnold, or do you still think they're leaning toward Josh Allen? I have no idea. Uh, and I say this with uh, John Dorsey was on the back of my book way back in the early 80s when he was a linebacker coming out of Connecticut. I've known John for a long, long time. We've been to Oriole games together. He's a good friend of mine. He's not telling me. I'm not even going to ask him. He's not going to tell me. He's not going to tell anybody. And uh, so I don't know. Darnold Allen, I don't know what Cleveland's doing. Uh, we've heard Allen a couple weeks ago. Everybody had changed their mocks to Allen. You know, I step, people say, why, do you, why are you staying with Allen? I haven't heard anything to take Allen out. Whoever you began with, Trey, if you began those mocks back in January with Darnold, you stayed with Darnold. You began those mocks as I did with Josh Allen, you stayed with Josh Allen because nothing's been said to, to affect your thinking. Mel Kuyper Jr. with us as we get set for the start of the draft. Again, Golik and Wingo will be there Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Come mm-hmm. check us out. And, of course, Mel and I will be doing all three days of the draft along with Lewis Riddick, Kirk Herbstreet, Todd McShay, Adam Schefter, Chris Mortensen, and a cast of thousands. But we're trying to put in perspective, Mel, why this draft is so unique. Because there's the potential of five and even six, potentially, quarterbacks going in the mm-hmm. first round. That would be significant because in the common draft era, going back to 1967, we've only had five Taken twice. 1995, there were five. And 1983, obviously, there were six. Uh, 99, excuse me. 1999, there were five. And 1983, there were six. So that, when we talk about three of the top five picks, maybe quarterbacks, five or six going in the first round, that makes this draft historically significant, right? It does. And it's kind of created a scenario where some really good players at the top of the board will be there at six, seven, eight, nine. Normally, that's not going to happen. But you could certainly make an argument that some of the best players in this draft are going to drop just a bit. Some of those names would be, when you think about where Derwin James, the safety from Florida State, Minka Fitzpatrick, the DB from Alabama, Denzel Ward, the cornerback Florida State, Roquan Smith, linebacker from Georgia, Quentin Nelson, guard Notre Dame. These guys could get pushed down just a bit. And I think it's interesting, too, Trey, where... You don't have offensive tackles. There's no offensive tackles in the top group. No wide receivers right now projected in the top group. Okay, So no pass rushers after Bradley Chubb projected until Marcus Davenport until Texas from Texas San Antonio goes in the middle of the first round. So it's one of those weird drafts uh, with these quarterbacks being pushed up uh, so high. And then you know, after Saquon Barkley, when does the next running back go? Where does Darius Geis, LSU, Sony Michelle, Georgia? They, does one of those two get into the late first round? It's going to be a lot of fun. There's a center. You talk about that center position, James Daniels, Iowa, Frank Ragnow from Arkansas. Does one of those two, or maybe both of those centers, get pushed into the first round? It's going to be a really fun evening Thursday night, and obviously uh, more, the fun will, I think, continue to rise and the entertainment value rise as we move forward to see which players are still on the board as we get into the second or third round of the draft. Maybe some of the guys that we expect to go into first don't go on Thursday night and have to wait until Friday. Mel, I've been waiting to get to you. I've been waiting <laughs> Mark, to get to you. Now. Let me ask you this, man. I, I, I think the dynamic in this draft is totally different because are you evaluating the quarterback for the potential that he has in the ceiling or the guy that's ready to come to your franchise and play right now? In my opinion. You're looking. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, Marcus? I think, Josh Rosen, think I think Josh Rosen is the more NFL ready right now. Yeah. I think Sam yeah. Borner has the highest ceiling, possibly Allen. How do you evaluate yeah. that? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think it matters. I, I think that, to me, is is something that people talk about, but what's the reality of it? And I know that some think all these quarterbacks are going to play this year, even though they look like they won't, because they'll be better than the guys, those some of those journeymen that are there. Somebody's going to get hurt. Maybe Bradford has had injury issues. Tannehill's had injury issues. But on paper, they <laughs> will be able to sit. I think Rosen is more equipped because of the offense, obviously the high IQ, all that, 
to play right away, but you never know. Mm. And I think the best laid plans, nobody thought Carson Wentz was going to play right away. Nobody thought Russell Wilson was going to beat out Matt Flynn. You never know how that's going to go. I don't think you evaluate a quarterback based on that. I saw John Elway struggle mightily as a rookie. I saw Steve Walsh look better than Troy Aikman when they were both together in training camp one year. Long term, short term, even short term did it matter, let alone long term. It doesn't. So I, I don't really concern myself with where they'll be in year one. I want to know where they'll be in year three through 12. Mm. And I think if you can get to that point in the evaluation and figure that all out, you're a heck of a lot better than you would be just worrying about who's going to be better year one when most of these rookies are going to have their share of issues anyway. Mel Kuyper Jr. with us as Draft Week is here. And just to show you how good Mel is, let's go back in time. He was 2005 grading of the draft. And this is what he gave the Dallas Cowboys, Mel. You gave them an A. Mm -hmm. One of the best hauls for any teams thanks to a significant upgrade on the defensive front seven. (laughs) DeMarcus Ware is a terrific attack linebacker. Marcus Spears is a great fit in a 3-4 scheme. Marion Barber is bigger and uh, defensive tackle Jay Ratliff is versatile enough to play a 3-4 or a 4-3. So, Mel, you nailed it, and you nailed it with Marcus Spears. My tip of the cap to you, sir. Yeah, Mel. LSU players usually don't let us down, right, Marcus? Hey. Usually you get an LSU player, they usually come in ready to play in the, the National shirt. Football League. They do. <laughs> now, our, our, our other uh, co-host today is Marty Fish, who is just the biggest Minnesota homer. Mel, all he cares about is what the Vikings do at 30. So, Marty, ask right. your question. Uh, Vikings at thirty, Mel. Um, well, I was, I was going to say one 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 thing real quick. Would, would would it be crazy to think that that Cleveland should take Saquon Barkley at number one and then take the best available quarterback at four? That, that would, I think, look good when you think about where Barkley is number one on most boards, Marty. But he's a running back, and there's some other pretty good ones in this draft. And I think you know, for John Dorsey, he was able to draft Kareem Hunt when he was the GM of the Kansas City Chiefs last year. We saw Alvin Kamara in round three, where Hunt went, do really well. I just think if you if you evaluate all these quarterbacks and you say, this is the guy, you can't wait till four because you're going to lose them. The Jets gave up three starters to go from six to three to get the third best quarterback possibly. The Browns picked number one. They passed in the past on Roethlisberger. They passed on Wentz. They passed on Watson. They passed on Carr. They passed on everybody. Now they can pick the one guy out of all these quarterbacks that everybody wants, these four. They have a shot to get the one that they deem the best. You can't wait till four and then take a chance of losing that guy because you see that division. Flacco's not going to be around forever. Neither is Ben Roethlisberger and Andy Dalton. I've said about a month ago. They can own this division if they nail this draft, and that starts with the quarterback at number one, and then worry about the running back. Uh, you know, If Barkley slipped to four, he probably won't, and then worry about the running back maybe in the second round when you can get a Sony Michelle, Georgia, a Darius Geis, LSU, or a Ronald Jones from USC. Yeah, okay, that's all great. Now now who are the Vikings <laughs> going to take at 30? <laughs> More important we need some questions. offensive line play. Yeah, the purple people eaters. Uh, yeah, you need offensive line help. And I think that's going to be where you look at a Jaron Christian uh, from Louisville as a kid who certainly has a lot of ability. Some think a corner could be in the mix if, say, a Mike Hughes from Central Florida dropped down that far. So uh, certainly the offensive line's got to be fixed. That's why Case Keenum had those struggles against the Eagles. It was the offensive line and the defensive front of the Eagles getting after Keenum. That Minnesota Viking offensive line was their issue, and they got to solve that problem. And I think Jaron Christian... You know about high ceiling for left tackles in this draft? He has a very high ceiling. Jaren, uh, Mel Kuyper Jr. with us, by the way. Jaron Christian, if he goes in the first round, he would have bragging rights over his brother. Gerald was Mr. Irrelevant in the 2015 <laughs> draft. So can you imagine the family dynamic there? Hey, that's great. You got drafted last. I was in the first round. There will be bragging rights in that table for a long time for Jaron Christian out of Louisville. Mel Kuyper Jr. Hey, reminding hey, us. Way, guys, yes, uh, yes, sir. Wingo's going to come up with, and I would say this to Marcus and Marty. There, he's going to come up with tidbits that I would have had no idea about. And that's something I, I didn't even remember that. I had no clue about that. So you will educate and enlighten throughout the three days, Trey. Mel, I, I'm here to give all the stupid stuff. You're giving the actual information. Let's be clear. And the first draft podcast with Kuyper and Todd McShay will get you ready for the upcoming NFL draft. Listen weekly on the ESPN app and the Apple podcast. So we talked about the quarterbacks, Mel, here. We could have six. Looks mm-hmm. like it's going to be five. Um, we know the Jets have already moved up. We know mm-hmm. that Cleveland wants a quarterback. Uh, we know that Buffalo and Arizona want a quarterback. What do you think the odds are that Buffalo, who sits at 12, and Arizona, who sits at 15, may try and jump up ahead, and we could have major trades day one of the draft? Well, I think you will. Uh, these quarterbacks, this jockeying for quarterbacks happened last year. It's going to happen this year. And I think Lamar Jackson's the pivotal one, or Baker Mayfield, 
drops or Rosen drops into that 7 to 11 range. What does Miami do? Do they stay at 11? What does Buffalo do? You know Buffalo move, made that move to get the pick at 12 to have a chance to move up to get a quarterback. It's too expensive to go up to 2, and the Giants don't want to move all the way back to 12. We get that. But at 5, you add Denver. Maybe that's where they move up to get that quarterback, be it Mayfield or Rosen. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen at number 1. And then Lamar Jackson gets interesting because some, maybe sometimes you can just sit where you are. Maybe Buffalo at 12 can't make that deal and they sit there and take Lamar. What does Arizona do? What does Pittsburgh, New England do late in the first round? Do they just wait it out? Uh, and Buffalo picks again at 22. So I think uh, Lamar Jackson is going to be the whole storyline. And we're going to be, after the four are gone, Lamar Jackson is going to be the next quarterback off the board. And like I said, and then Mason Rudolph, does he get into day two when he could maybe be a late one? That 32nd picks the Philadelphia Eagles. Everybody seems to think the Eagles are trading out at 32. That could be a spot to jump in and maybe look at a Mason Rudolph. If you know you're not going to get him in the late second, you get him at the end of the first. So could we have six quarterbacks in the first round? Maybe. Mel, I got to ask the stupid question that may, <laughs> may have me never invited back. But I got to ask you this, and I know I know the paradigm. I understand how important the quarterback position is. But what if I said this? What if I said take Saquon Barkley one and take Bradley Chubb four and buy yourself a year or two with Tyrod Taylor in Cleveland? How stupid would that sound? That would be ridiculous, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hold back, Mel. Don't ridiculous. hold back, Mel. Let's go. Bring it. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, there's nothing else to say, Mark. <laughs> it's a quarterback league. This is a Browns team that's passed on everybody. So they're going to pass on four of them? <laughs> and, uh, I mean, you know, Tyrod Taylor's okay. But you know, this is, again, where you could get the special entity. One, you know, Two of these four. And, and you throw Lamar in at five. Some of these quarterbacks are going to be special. Okay. When yeah. we had three go back in 2004, all were really good. There was no bust to that group with Eli, Ben, and Philip Rivers. So you never know. People say two, yeah, 50% of these guys are going to be bust. We don't know that. Uh, and we know that a couple of these are going to be big time or at least really good. It happens all the time. The two, the two of these guys. So how is Cleveland guy who has that choice? And John Dorsey is a great football man. He's got to figure that out. And he will figure that out at number one. So the quarterback's too important, Marcus, to worry about a running back that you get at any point in the draft. And a defensive end, which is really good, next put that opposite Miles Garrett, but they may be able to get Bradley Chubb at four and get the quarterback oh, at one. So go QB one, Barkley goes two to the Giants, Darnold or Allen go three, and then all of a sudden you're sitting there at four with Bradley Chubb. So I'd rather have my franchise quarterback at one and Bradley Chubb at four than Saquon Barkley at one and Chubb at four and then have just Tyrod Taylor and I'm passing on another star quarterback, which is our history. Now, and when we took some, we weren't very good either, but yeah, this is the Browns history. They've had all kinds of blunders. The guys they take turn out to be busts and the guys they don't take turn out to be stars. But I think that's changing with John Dorsey. Well, Thanks, a, a, yeah, as I said, by the way, you're still invited back <laughs> after that question. <laughs> Mel has a philosophy, just so you know. He will never take a running back. If you could find Emmett Smith, Jim Brown, and Walter Payton rolled into one, Mel would still he not would take still a running back him. in the first yeah. round. He just wouldn't do it. And as, you know, it's backed up by last year, arguably the two best running backs in the rookie class were both third round guys, Kareem Hunt and Alvin Kamara. Mel Kuyper Jr. with us. Okay, if, if Baker Mayfield is the swing state in terms of quarterbacks, you know, people have very strong feelings about him one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Is the Giants at number two, are they the swing pick? Because, you know, a lot of people say, hey, they got to get a replacement for Eli. Or Saquon's there. He's the best player in the draft. You got to take him. Or are they saying, hey, come get number two if you want a quarterback? Yeah, I think this is a great spot, and it's a very challenging spot. It's like when Marcus came out, everybody wanted Marcus. Where do you go? you got all these great schools who want you. Where do you go? It's tough to isolate just one and pass on two or three others. It's like you go in looking for the ice cream. What ice cream? you, you got all these great choices. You know, uh, you know, do you like a crab cake? you like shrimp? you like steak? you got all these different uh, choices, and they're all really good. And I think it's going to really indicate where they think this organization is with Eli Manning. And because you can get Darnold or Allen, you're sitting there, you've got one of those two quarterbacks. And how much for longer is Eli playing at a high level? Or you can take Saquon Barkley to help Eli. Or trading out really isn't an option because you're losing those elite guys if you move down to 12. Then you say Bradley Chubb, a defensive end over the quarterback, over a running back. I would, but they would. I would never take him over the quarterback. So all these different options that are all really good, which one do they feel is the best option? So sometimes you, know, you figure, hey, I'd rather just have one guy I love and I know if he's there, I'm taking him. Now you got three or four different ways to go. I think it's going to be really interesting. Dave Gettleman said, I want a Hall of Famer. Now, 
Hey, quarterbacks can become Hall of Famers. This notion you can't take a quarterback because he's not going to be a Hall of Famer, uh, you're going to miss on a lot of guys. Uh, 20 of the 32 starting quarterbacks, by the way, in the NFL went in the first round. Four went in the second. That's 24 of 32 in the first two rounds. If you want a quarterback from the third round on, you're catching lightning in a bottle. And good luck on that. Good luck finding the next Russell Wilson or Tom Brady. That doesn't work. Tony Romo when he was an undrafted free agent. Good luck on that one. All right, listen, Mel, you just said, as Mel Kuyper Jr. joins us, you just said you finished up your final evaluation. So when all is said and done, based not on who's going to go number one, but based on all the input and the data you've looked at, the best player available in the 2018 NFL draft is? Running back Saquon Barkley. Even though you'd never take him number one overall. <laughs> Hey, I said this. Remember that caveat? I said, if I'm the GM and I got a head coach and a coordinator and the rating is right where it needs to be, and I said this about Zeke Elliott, I said it about Gurley and Fournette, I said it about Trent Richardson, he was a bust. But if that rating is in line and you need him as a missing link and the coordinator and the coach said, I got to have him, we can't not take this running back, and the grade indicates he should go at that spot, I just say, okay, you win that battle. But more times than not, it's not worth taking a running back in the first round of the draft. History proves that. Well, you're, well, look, you're right. I mean, it's an interesting thing, but I, I love the fact that you're conflicted about this because you would never do it, but the data tells you that Saquon Barkley is yeah, the best way player I would in the blame draft. It on them. Yeah. I would blame it on them, Trey, and have my, my win-win, you know, because I'll find, what I would do then is I would take another running back down the line. And just as a little insurance policy, or just to prove my point, if I were you know, I'll let them have their running back there, I'll get a running back fourth or fifth round, third round, and I know can be maybe as good, close enough to make it very interesting. Okay, so before we let's go real quickly, give me that running back that you can could be an Alvin Kamara, that that yeah. could be a Kareem Hunt in this year. Who's a third or fourth round back that may surprise people? Well, I think in the third round, you could see Nick Chubb from Georgia. If you wow. do, he could fall you got that a kid far. Who is a Powerful late second, early third, he could. And then Kareem, Kareem Hunt had a great senior bowl, yet he dropped to the third round. Alvin Kamara was a dynamic player. Tested out, he had almost 11 broad jump. He had a 40 vertical. He was a tremendous athlete with versus, he went in the third round. So, you know, these guys, Todd McShay thought Count Kamara would go in the late first round. So we're going to find Rashad Penny, versatile kid at San Diego State. He could be there in the third round. Naheem Hines, who does everything at NC State. Kind of like a Deion Harris, Darren Stroke. He could be in the third, fourth round. So you know, we, we can talk about running backs. We will find on day two, day three, some really good running backs coming off the board. Mel, you're the best, brother. I'll see you Wednesday at the draft meeting, okay? Can't wait, guys. Take care, man. Thanks, see Mel. You, see you Commander Mel, Mel you signing off. See you, Mark. This has been the best of Golick and Wingo podcast. You can listen or subscribe on the ESPN app, Apple Podcasts, or just ask your smart speaker to play Golick and Wingo. Plus, you can check the guys out live weekday mornings from 6 to 10 Eastern on ESPN Radio and on ESPN News. What is it, Linda? I think we should see other people. Are you breaking up with me on a roller coaster? Well, we do have a lot of fun. Maybe we should stay together. An emotional roller coaster? Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to Geico. I just need a little me time. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15%.